You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome back to the Sasquatch, brought to you by the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast, presented by Magic Mind and Pineless Nursery. Brent, I can only imagine why you, you called <laughs> our podcast that. I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're going with the, if you can't beat them, join them yeah. uh, mentality. Yeah, I figure we'll throw that name out there, and maybe that will propel us up with the other Sasquatch Bigfoot podcasts <laughs> yeah. that are reigning the charts. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. well, welcome back to The Buzz. Yeah, so this is The Buzz, and I'm Tom Knezic, and we're buzzing in episode 141. And before we get into all the really cool native plant stuff, uh, which I have a interesting article this week, and I am think you do too from okay. Glancing Ahead, we want to do a little bit of follow-up on some stuff. Um, yes. First one is we still have those job postings up. You can find them on our Facebook. You can find them on our website. There's a little menu in the top left on our website. You scroll down, it says career opportunities. There's a whole list there of stuff. Um, there's actually one or two I need to add as well. And uh, two was we have our, our native plant uh, growers group, yes. which we had our in-person meeting. Which was a wonderful yeah. – man, what a fantastic evening that turned out to be. I mean we all kind of expected it would be a good evening, but we had – would you say like close to 30 people from yeah, it was all nearly, over the country? 30 people. I think when I counted, there was like 10 or 11 states represented yeah. between those 30 people. And it was fun just sitting back at one point being the introvert that, that I am, sitting back and just mm-hmm. kind of like chowing down on food and watching people having great conversations going from group to group and yeah. it, like meeting oh, yeah. new people and, and having impactful conversations, which mm-hmm. you, there were a lot of contacts made that night, Definitely. which was nice Definitely. to see. So, yeah, it was a good start. And um, and then I was just on a phone call the other day with uh, some folks from – uh, Oregon State and Florida and all over the place where they had actually been working on something similar, uh, a similar idea, more with a retail focus and like how to bring these plants, the restoration. There's a lot of these restoration focused nurseries when you go out across the country, um, but there's not the retail supply. So they're working on that end of things. So uh, we're going to start working together was kind of what we talked about yeah. is not formally yet. Just kind of see, hey, what are our interests and in, like just keep giving each other feedback yeah. but but it, it was nice to see people having conversations saying we need this this has been needed where do we go from here mm-hmm. yeah so yeah. we're 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 happy to see what the next steps were and that that conversation was started and it was it was really exciting like Definitely. everyone left there pretty pumped up and the next day everyone was saying how great of a time yeah so if you are a, a native plant uh grower Grower. so someone who's working at a nursery owns a nursery that is primarily growing native plants or you're working in the seed business or own a seed business that is primarily uh, growing or supplying native seed. Those are the folks that we want to join this group. Doesn't matter where in the country you are. We want to have that in this national, country. Yeah. In, in, yeah. In, in at least North America. Yeah. Um, just so we can get started. And the first step is like, we just went to the mid Atlantic nursery trade show. Hey, let's have a meet up there. There's the far West trade show in, in Oregon, yes. Portland, I think. Yeah. Have a meet up for the people who are out there. And there's years, like, I'm not planning on going to Portland, but there's years I will go to Portland just to check out and see yes. what's new. And then uh, hopefully there's people who picked up the ball and are hosting that kind of stuff. And then I can go and join and meet people in a different part of the country. It's kind of like growing native plants. Kind of like Fight Club. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll yeah. check out these other clubs in other parts of the country. Yep, yep. <laughs> so, and then I brought up the Mid Atlantic Nursery Trade Show. We just got back from that. We recorded a secret tape. On the way down and way yeah. back. Yeah. Um, Had, did you listen to it to hear the quality? It was okay. It was okay. Yeah, it's All like right. it's it's secret tape quality. It's not All supposed right. to. It's supposed to be a little rough around the edges. Yeah, it is. But um, we had some good conversations. Yeah, we had some good conversations. Probably better on the way there than the way back. We were more uh, well thought out and and poignant with our conversations on the way there. The way back, you could tell we were like beat down and battered. <laughs> from <laughs> we're our, we're losing our voices. Yeah, three days on concrete. Yeah, it was a. Uh, we were a little tired. That was towards but the end the of the But the show road. itself was really encouraging. Uh, the yeah. first time it's really been uh, well attended back in person since uh, since 2020. For our listeners that aren't in the industry and don't know, this trade show, which occurs – it's the first trade show of the year every year at the beginning of January in Baltimore, Maryland. And it's the biggest nursery trade show. So it's not a conference. It's, it's really nursery industry mm-hmm. all-encompassing. 
Um, yeah, there's no like education sessions or any of that kind of stuff. It's you go in and there's I don't even know two hundred eighteen hundred eighteen hundred booths, booths, booths like, something like that, and then hundreds of nurseries there from all over, primarily the East Coast. But there's you have some from out west. You have a bunch from Florida, yeah. Texas, or uh, I don't know how many states are actually represented. And then you, if you're a landscaper, you're like, oh, I'm looking for X Y Z plant, and I'm going to go probably, see. Who, I can probably find it there. Who yeah. has it, and who I like, and who I like to deal with, and that kind of stuff. So back in the day, there was a trade show every week in mm-hmm. a different part of the country, and they've kind of that has kind of gone away. Yeah. This one has flourished. This yep. is the one that survived on yeah, the east so, coast. So yeah, it's a it's one of those things where I uh, I enjoyed it. But I'm glad I don't have to do it again until next January. I agree. <laughs> I agree. It's, uh, but we've even said, hey, you know what? Sometimes it's like, oh, why are we wasting our time coming to this? And this was every three, four years. I feel like we have one like this one where it's like, oh, no, this is worth it. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure, I think next year I'll probably be like, oh, yeah, are we wasting our time coming to this? <laughs> but it, what was encouraging, like I said, is – a lot of people coming up and asking about native plants. A lot of garden centers coming up and asking about native that plants. Was, we, we're one of the first first booths when you come in, and people are like, mm-hmm. oh, great. This, you know, My biggest priority was finding native plants yep. this year, and that was the buzzword. You know, and We noticed a lot of nurseries that maybe only are 20% native putting native plants yep. in, in their, their signage. Their literature their and literature, in their signage. Yeah. Um, and then we got to meet a lot of the listeners too. There's a, numerous, With, a number of people who are – in the industry in some capacity, whether a landscape architect or a contractor or or work for another nursery that listen to our podcast. And um, even if they don't have the opportunity to do business with us, yeah. they were stopping by to say, hey, I, I listen. Yeah, it's I, just uh, it's it's uh, rewarding to, to meet some of you guys in person and talk to you a little mm-hmm. bit about. What we, we enjoy so much doing. We so. met Ryan in person who listened to us. How many Oh yeah, hours or minutes. <laughs> I think listen the most, but. which it was very nice to meet everyone and stop yep, by, yep. and we really appreciate being able to put a face with some of the names because we have conversations in the Facebook group too. So it's just nice oh, yeah. to be able to say hello. Yeah, definitely. And um, and speaking of Mance, my plant that I chose this week for that's hot actually ties into Mance. Well, let's uh, so let's get well, into let's, that. It's hot. All right, well, go first. Yeah, got to do so, the good uh, segue. So this is a plant that is not native where we are. It's native to the Pacific Northwest, and that's uh, Thuya Placata. Which is, and, we, um, we and about I wouldn't this. say this is necessarily, it, it is an evergreen, and typically in the winter we talk about evergreens. Yes. Um, I would not say this is a plant I'd like, but <laughs> but it was uh, top of mind going to this trade show. It's um, the most requested plant. Yeah. It's 20 yeah. years running. Easy. So, uh, so basically, the the common name for this plant, and this I got a lot of this information from from wildflower dot org, and uh, it's the Western Arborvitae or Western Red Cedar. It's a narrow pure uh, pure pyramidal 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 to uh, squat stature tree, buttress at the base, tapering upward to a simple or divided apex. It uh, usually maintains its lower branches. The evergreen typically or evergreen's typical height is fifty to seventy five feet, but it can grow to two hundred feet. The aromatic foliage is bright green and scale-like, forming horizontal sprays with bronzes to crimson purple in winter. Large to very large tree with a tapering trunk, buttress at the base with a narrow conical crown of short spreading branches drooping at ends. Foliage is res- resinous uh, and aromatic. And again, that's from wildflower.org. Our friends over there do a great job profiling this. Why I bring this up is people who don't know that we're and, – and again, this is a native plant somewhere in the world – and but there's a cultivar that's very popular, and I feel like every other booth has one that is not a native plant grower, and that's green giant, green giant arborvitaes. It's so. it's a cross, actually, I believe, because yeah. I think it's X green giant, so I think it's placata yep, yep. crossed with something else. Yeah, I think so. and when I've looked it up before, but it does have roots in being a native plant, a, a native plant too. And, a and we part have of the listeners all over the country, so I'm sure we have listeners that are happy that we're yeah discussing this. Yeah, plant, now but. I think this plant is way overused. I don't think it's that attractive. Um, I do but think it serves a purpose. I do think it's attractive when, once it gets to a certain height. When it's younger, it's mm-hmm. a lot of leader. It could be a, a six-foot tall tree oh, yeah. and three-foot yeah. leader, and it takes a while to grow into that. And I think but it grows. have – Yeah. It grows a foot a year. Like if you're looking for a, like a fast screen, yeah. like for evergreen, that fills in quickly. Yeah, and that's where I guess 
the, it's not that I don't think the tree itself is unattractive. I think how it's used is unattractive. Because uh, people well, end up yeah. building these screens that are way too close together. And it, it does it serves the purpose. Yeah. But it's like you're you're And gets way too tall for the conditions that yeah. they're putting them. It's uh you're just creating this plant bomb. I you basically put up a fence. It just happens to be plants. What I what I would be interesting to interested in knowing is it's wildlife uh yeah. functions um just like how if i don't know if they yeah, list I, that on wildflower.org on, i'm sure they have something there they have um, to have like if it's if it's a larval host for something uh if it hosts any lepidoptera or i would imagine that it has to be good screening or good hiding uh, habitat for yeah. nesting for birds or something like that i would think let's see uh this is from uh native plants pacific northwest uh scrolling scrolling Scrolling. (laughs) (laughs) Phenology, propagation, use by people. They use the wood for for shelters. Um, They actually, on this website, they didn't have anything about about wildlife use. There's got to be something. Um, But that's beside the point at this point. I just want to point out that it's everyone's using this plant in the landscape trade it's it's got to be well i've seen lists where it's the number one plant requested and um and i'm not the only one who doesn't like it because i know the guys from (laughs) completely arbitrary they don't like it either and one of them is an arborist and he's like i think it's it's crap but i don't know it's uh it's definitely not one of my favorites when i see them i cringe a little bit i'm like uh i don't like those Are, are you telling me you don't like native plants uh, I don't like this plant in particular, <laughs> right. um, and that's allowed. But, uh, that's allowed. Yeah, and it's it's uh, but it's it's not so much because of its where you find it, like in the wild, which I've never seen in the wild. It's more. It's just so like I right across from my house. There's a yeah. housing development, and they have a line of these that they put up way too close together. They're all grown together, and then when one dies because they're stressed because they're yeah. too close together yeah. um, and they're growing into each other, one dies, it just completely <laughs> makes it even look worse. And then you have the ones, like, so you have a bunch that are 12 feet tall and then one that's six feet tall and it just... At 12, know, it's, 12 foot wide. <laughs> I've never seen it work out where it's like, oh, this is, this well, actually looks really good. That's usage. It's, that's it's usage. a usage thing. It's not necessarily the plant that I don't yeah. like. It's the usage. That's it's the just usage. so overused and it's... It makes it easy from a and and we're doing the same thing from our perspective as, as a business. Yeah. Like, hey, we need to we need to trim back and only grow the things that sell. And if I'm a landscaper, I'm like, oh, I know this is going to work, and I only have to buy yeah. one thing. I don't have to buy ten things. Yeah. So I get it from a an economic standpoint. I just you know here on the the problem is them. here where <laughs> we're at in the, like temp, in the temperate northeast, people are are craving for evergreens, which isn't a staple yeah. of the temperate Northeast. Mm-hmm. It's, it just isn't. So it the, it gets stretched and used in a way that it shouldn't get used. Um, and, I don't know how it's used. And when someone asks parts. me and says, hey, I need – I want to put up – my neighbor, we had a hedgerow. They took it down or they took their fence down. I need something to screen out the neighbor. This is what I recommend because there really isn't a lot of other better options. Yeah. Um, although I – like I'll point to red cedar. Um, you see a lot of – like – Locally, we see a lot of green giant. You see Leyland yeah. cypress, which really are top rooted, and yep. then you get that where half the windbreak blows over once it gets forty foot tall. Yeah. You <laughs> yep. know, so yep. it's it, you're just creating other problems. Yeah, yeah. You know, so. and I don't know what those answers are personally. You could take, you could take a bunch of deciduous shrubs. And mix them with grasses and mm-hmm. create a border with shrubs. Oh yeah, and that's you know, someone just asked me at this at this trade show and said, "Hey, what can I do? Um, I want to have it native plants. I had a line of red cedars. The township came in, widened the road, cut my cedars down. What can I? Well, you can put more red cedar one, but if you want to do something more diverse, look at like inkberry holly or yeah, ilex verticillata, which such is a lack uh, winterberry of holly, not an evergreen, but you have some arrowwood uh, viburnum, um, one like that it, we don't grow, American hazelnut." I've heard is great for making like yeah. that hedgy thicket. It gets so thick, you even though it's not evergreen, you can't really see through it. Yeah. And it has so much wild wildlife value between the flowers and the catkins, and then the um, the the nuts. Yeah. And and I like the layered look, like doing some yeah. of those eight to fifteen foot shrubs, putting some smaller shrubs like mm-hmm. uh, sweet pepper bush in front of it, or yep. Yep. or panicum vergatum. Mm-hmm. Something that gives you a little bit that evergreen, like if you don't yeah. cut it back over the winter, and and you you're serving the purpose and creating so much habitat space rather than just 
thinking, I just want this blocked out. Yeah. But think about – this is something that gets 200 foot tall. Think how wide that's going to – like oh, yeah. it hasn't it's, become uh, a problem yet on these properties because they haven't been there long enough. Mm-hmm. But think about how wide this plant has to get. It's if you do a, a border around your property and you have a small property, that's going to take up most yeah. of your property. At our seed farm, we it's not green giants, but it's um I don't even know I remember exactly what what kind of arborvitae it is, but it's they planted them at like two foot spacing, so now they're forty feet tall, and it literally looks we had to. Because they got too wide, and they're right next to the, the main lane that goes down the farm. So we had to come in with, like, a side mower and mow off half the branches, like, 10 feet up just so we could drive underneath of them. Yeah. Um, so that was already an issue. And then, um, then so that exposed side honestly almost looks like a, a fence post. Yeah, <laughs> so they're just it in does. There. It almost looks like a, a regular, like, slat fence because they're so tight together. It's ridiculous. But right. at the time, the guy who owned the property before us had a bunch of these seedlings. So, oh, what am I going to do with them? I want to make a windscreen for the driveway so I don't have right. to deal with all the, the snow load yeah. and put them in really tight. I think his plan eventually was, hey, I'm going to cut out every, like, leave one, cut out four, yeah. leave one, cut out four. But he never did. And That's uh, always the plan. Yeah, this don't is what don't fall prey. Use, <laughs> yeah. use the understory shrub to do that, to do that bordering. Um, all right. Just for the sake of time, because I know we have a little bit of a time we do, limit. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on and, and not something you would think of this time of the year. My plant isn't something that's that's hot right now in terms of how it looks, but it's hot right now in the terms of how people are talking about it. So my plant this week is pawpaw, which is yeah, a, nice. Our our native pawpaw is a semina triloba. I didn't realize how many native species there were of pawpaw. Triloba is the northernmost uh Species, but uh, part of the reason that I'm bringing it up is I, I recently just saw an article in Better Homes and Gardens on how to plant and grow pawpaw at the trade show. That was probably one of the more most requested plants that we had people coming up to our booth and asking about. And also, Tom and I were able to get away and get to the uh, the North American Guinness Brewery in Arbutus, Maryland, and we got to enjoy a pawpaw pale ale, which was Quite arguably the most enjoyable beer I had. Oh, it was uh yeah, it was definitely my my favorite of um of what we had there. Although the the other ones we had the Guinness Blonde. We did, which is uh, which was good. And then there was a I don't the other ones we had were good too. It was like a, mine was like a cojito beer that was pretty nice. I had a French yeah. seventy five, which was done with a champagne uh, uh what do you call it? Um not yeast, but it was. But, uh, yeah, I know it, what you're it, saying. It was. It had a lot of floral scents to it, and mm-hmm. it was a very high ABV, and it was good. But I kept thinking about we had the Paul Paul beer first, and every beer. Not that I had a lot, but every beer I had after that, I kept thinking about the Paul Paul beer because yep, it yep. was so crisp. And they're not canning it, so if you're in that area, go have one. Yeah, and it was definitely the best of what the ones we tried. Yeah, um, and it just kind of highlights how you can use native plants in different ways, and. Uh, and how was, I always love ways that it's like, okay, this is becomes a different part of our culture because it's part of our food or it's part of what we yeah. drink or you're transforming it into something. In this case, was pretty amazing. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, just real quick, and again, I took my information from Wallflower dot org as well. Uh, common pawpaw is small, short trunk tree or large multi stemmed shrub, ten to forty foot tall. Large tropical leaves, young shoots and leaves are covered with a rusty down, uh, later becoming smooth. The thick, bright green deciduous leaves turn yellow-green in the fall. Not particularly showy, but interesting. Purple, six-petaled flowers are born uh, sing- singly in leaf axles before leaf emergence. Uh, kind of smell like rotting flesh <laughs> um, mm-hmm. to attract the flies that pollinate them. Um, large cylindrical, dark green or yellow edible fruit follows. Common pawpaw is the northernmost New World representative of a chiefly tropical family, which includes the popular tropical f- uh, fruits Anona, custard apple, sugar apple, and soursop. The wild fruit was once harvested, but the supply has now decreased greatly due to the clearing of forests. The small crop is generally consumed only by wildlife, such as opossums, squirrels, and raccoons and birds. Tents have been made to cultivate common pawpaw as a fruit tree, first recorded by the DeSoto Expedition in the Lower Mississippi Valley in 1541. The name Common Paw Paw is from the Arawakan name of papaya, an unrelated tropical American fruit. So I think uh, we we always wax poetic about Paw Paw. 
so I don't think we need to say much more than that. But for new listeners that are unfamiliar with it, uh, definitely uh, give it a try if you haven't. And and we're seeing people trying to bring this plant back. We what was it? It was Ohio. I did the article. Or was it you that did the article? The Ohio Paul Paul Festival. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so yeah. cool. It's, yeah. So you ready to? Yeah. Let's uh, let's get into this week's botany based current events and roll on to this or that. We do have a winner, and I just checked the update just to see where we're at. It, it got a little bit closer, but the winner is Tom won nine to six. Oh. So uh, our last ones were I had the article in um, Volunteer Opportunities uh, mm-hmm. in uh, that was that Boston. that was that episode. We didn't have I another. Think so one I just that? looked, and and that's what showed. Like I double checked, yeah, okay. and it was December. It feels like it was so long ago. Uh, and the California carbon offset, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was, but that's – yeah, December 27th. Yeah. So. I'm still upset you didn't laugh hard enough at my joke I made in that episode. Do I ever really laugh yeah. at him? Well, I, there was a transition. <laughs> it was a transition between you did an article about California. I did an article about California, and I said – and we're going going back back to Cali Cali, and you didn't even chuckle. Oh, I smiled. You know, I don't uh, even know if you smiled. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I was disappointed. I was – I, I felt like it was overshadowed. No, here's the thing. I got <laughs> lost in thought because I started <laughs> thinking of the video – and and actually singing going back to Cali in my head. Okay, like, yeah. yeah. That's a, a meager or meek. Well, I don't know what word. It's a bad excuse. That's what I'm trying to say. Wait, because it's. I'm trying to think. It's like heels tall, something small. <laughs> I like to see the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Ren is doing all the hand the symbols. Hand symbols too. from the video. That's not going to so. really thank go. You, thank go you, through. LL. Um, <laughs> all right, so you get to choose. You want to go first? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Um, that way, I can. Uh, you got a lot of article here. I'm Fred. not reading the whole thing. I just put it all in there so that I can pick and choose what I yeah. want to say. So, so my article is titled "We're being a little more picky." How cities are rethinking their trees in the face of climate change. Um, it was by Alex Brown. It was in on FastCompany.com, um, and it's six minute read. If you want to read this yourself, it's fairly short. I even made it shorter for you guys because I'm not going <laughs> to. And it'll probably still, still take me six minutes to read all of where, it because I'm I'm a slow reader. Where my article so. is four pages <laughs> long in here, but um, and uh, it's not necessarily about native plants, but it's tack or it talks about a lot of native plants because okay. uh, and, well, we've talked about a bunch where street she, street trees in cities are already a very complex issue, and it's just going to get more complex. So, um, I'll read a little bit and then give some more of my thoughts. So. Cities need to plant more trees, but not just any trees. As communities prepare for a massive influx of federal funding to support urban forestry, their leaders say the tree canopy that grows to maturity 50 years from now will need to be painted with a different palette than the one that exists today. Forestry experts say trees are critical infrastructure and can help cities withstand the effects of climate change by providing shade, absorbing stormwater, and filtering air pollution. But to do that, the trees themselves need to be resilient. We're developing plant lists that are diverse, that look uh, to tolerance the drought, storm events, flooding, heat changes, and uh, the highs and lows. This is Kevin Sayers, Urban Forestry Coordinator with Michigan Department of Natural Resources. While arborists look for trees that will thrive in climate conditions they're likely to face in the coming decades, scientists say they simply can't count out the handful of climate winners. Many cities, for example, have lost vast amounts of their tree canopy because they rely too heavily on one or too heavily on one type of tree that was later wipe, wiped out by a pathogen or pests such as death elm disease or emerald ash borer. Um, Ball, who's had a quote earlier that I took out. Uh, he urges cities not to plant more than fifty or five percent of one genus of tree, but many communities have struggled to reach that uh, reach the diversity goals that he and other forest health experts recommend. Foresters say it tackles effort to determine which trees will grow in challenging urban conditions, and nurseries often lack the less common trees they're looking for. Amid those challenges, cities and states are preparing to receive $1.5 billion in urban forestry funding approved by car- Congress earlier this year as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Forestry leaders say that the newfound support will be transformative, but turning the money into healthy tree canopy decades from now will be a complicated task. In Seattle, many of the city's big leaf maples and western red cedars, uh, well, we just talked about there that tree, uh, are struggling in urbanized areas. Foresters are now careful to plant them in favorable microclimates with conditions such as good soil moisture and north-facing slopes that remain cooler. Meanwhile, the city is planting more Pacific uh, madrone. Is it madrone or madroni? Do you know that plant? I, I don't know. Uh, and Gary Oaks that tolerate hotter, drier conditions. 
And within individual tree species, it's adding trees grown from seeds taken from further south in their range with the, global, uh, with the goal of adding resilient genotypes to the mix. State officials in Texas operate a genetic improvement program that has produced nine Texas-tested, Texas-tough tree species that are adapted to handle difficult conditions, including the Schumard oaks and bald cypress. Uh, scientists at the University of Florida are working to determine which trees best withstand high winds. They're hoping to expand an existing Florida-based classification system by looking at research from hurricane-prone communities worldwide. Above all, experts say that diversity is the best way to ensure that many trees survive the changes and the coming or that are coming, rather than pin, or pinning all their hopes on guesstimates of which trees might thrive. In most communities, the existing tree canopy is far from that goal. Elm trees were once among the most pom- prominent trees in America's urban forests. When Dutch elm disease wiped many of those out, many tree, or many cities replanted with ash. Now they're taking down millions of trees that have been ravaged by the emerald ash borer. Today, maples pro, uh, proliferate in, se- in cities, and foresters are casting a wary eye towards any threats to those trees. You could plant elm and ash anywhere on any soil and grow them, said Ball, a South, uh, the South Dakota forestry specialist. Now we're done with the easy trees. You better know what your soils are like. You've got to understand the microenvironments in your community and fine-tuning your plantings. Nurseries have uh, have a shortage of the species diversity we're looking for, and that's a tough crack, uh, tough to crack because it's the private sector, said Keith Wood, a contractor from the National Association of State Foresters, who staffs the group's Committee on Urban and Community Forestry. Arbors cite a feedback loop where nurseries grow only what sells and cities buy only what's available. But nurseries need some certainty if they're going to grow less marketable and harder to cultivate species on a large scale, said Nancy Buley, a communications director with J. Frank Schmidt and Son, uh, a co, a large nursery in Oregon that supplies many urban planting efforts. For the cities and nonprofits to get more unusual trees to meet their species diversity goals, she said, they're really going to need to contract in some way. Listen, that's Which really I'm glad, yeah. I'm that's, glad they got the the nursery opinion there too. <clears throat> that's really the conundrum, yep. and 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 here's part of the issue. It's a little bit different for for us because we're dealing with smaller sized product. But when you're a bald and burlap tree nursery, mm-hmm. you have years invested in that tree, especially if you're growing from seed or or cuttings or yep. grafts. You may have five to seven years before you have a saleable mm-hmm. crop, and then your window is limited before it gets. Yeah. Too oh, big yeah. that that maybe it's even harder to find. Mm-hmm. So at Princeton, we did when I was at Princeton, we did a lot of native trees. They were, you know, when they went, they went to projects, but they were the least requested tree. So if you have a block of Celtis that now are starting mm-hmm. to hit three and a half to four inch caliper, which aren't going to get used for street trees, you know, they want that two inch, two and a half inch caliper tree that's manageable and and small enough to transport and get in there and be price effective, it's uh, it becomes difficult to manage that because then you're just – you waste it five years, seven years, and then you're bulldozing the trees because you don't have a market for it. So they need to have some certainty to to grow those plants. Otherwise, you don't want to keep bulldozing a crop you spent five to seven years on uh, or, or more, 10 years uh, for a saleable crop. So – and I, I've witnessed it. I've seen it. Um, but I'm happy to see that they're looking for that biodiversity. When you go – and you're familiar with this. When you head mm-hmm. into Princeton, New Jersey, uh, I think it's Washington Street, mm-hmm. and it's all Princeton Elm yeah. uh, heading into the university. Now, Princeton Elm is a DED-resistant plant, mm-hmm. but over time, you still lose some. Yeah. Yep. So now you have this LA, mm-hmm. this beautiful LA that you go from – a full-grown tree to a two-inch caliper tree to something that was replaced 20 years ago, and they're trying to keep it, but diversity-wise, it's not really working. Like, it was beautiful for a while, mm-hmm. and it, it's hard to say that's what people think of. Head yeah. heading, you know, yeah. you think of all the the Princeton University grads that think of that LA heading into the university. It's, it's hard to move away from that, mm-hmm. but as far as street tree diversity, you need that diversity – to, like like you need genetic diversity yeah. in a restoration it's, project. Uh, just just for the the plant community to survive, you need that diversity. Yeah. Like like Fran was just saying, you have my brother. I don't want to say jokingly. He general general. It's a generalization. I'm really struggling with some words. <laughs> it's a generalization, but he says nature tends to not like monocultures. Yeah, it's like that's why succession happens because an an important part of succession is sometimes. Plant diseases. Yeah. Solidago is a really good example where there are insects that you're not going to have them until you have a, a high enough population density of 
a certain goldenrods, and um, and then they transit transmit a different. I think it's a bacteria. Yeah. It might be a fungus. I don't remember. Um, and all of a sudden, like all those goldenrods will die out just because it just they're so tight, they're so oppressive that they just spreads like wildfire. Yeah. And that when they die out, it gives way for the next few species. It tends to be some woody shrubs to come through. Um, so it's important that that happens. Like, like he's, my brother says, nature doesn't want a monoculture. It wants to be constantly yeah. evolving and changing and you might have monocultures at times. So now we're trying to put in a monoculture. So it's, it kind of reflects what I was saying about the, the our buddies is like, I know it's easy to just do one thing and just, but is it's that what's answer. actually best in the long run? in a lot of cases, or is it better to have that diverse wall that has not just one, it's hitting one of one objective, which might be the highest priority. I want a good screen or I want to have shade on this, on this uh, building or street. But now you have something that's also supporting birds and also supporting insects and also supporting a variety of other things. Uh, it's helping the fish because it's shading out the stream. And then, you know, it's going to survive for a long time instead of something that's uh no, it's not. You know, and it's hard because as humans, we're killing – constantly killing unintentionally the biodiversity of our mm-hmm. forest. You yeah. think uh, you go back pre-settlement, you have all these beautiful uh, chestnuts and mm-hmm. ash and elm and – I mean we're losing oaks now. We're, mm-hmm. we're losing oaks. So you yeah. think of oak forest or ash forest. You know, We're changing the landscape unintentionally. And those trees aren't really coming back, not yet. I know there's so much work being done to try yeah. to bring those trees back, but right now it's just not happening. So it's um, it's nice to see that we've learned from our mistakes. We're trying to get diversity in and and try to help that so that it doesn't wipe it out even more. Um, it's just it's, it's just a very emotional topic. <laughs> so. That's a great article, though, Tom. Thank you for yeah, introducing. Yeah, I'm so, looking forward to your article too. So mine is a very long article, but I'm going to try to shorten it up. I'll read a little bit of it. Um, maybe I'll skip around a little bit. But there were some great articles I saw out there that you had to pay for, and I didn't want to do. Pay. I was mentioning how they're they're talking about using social mm-hmm. media to track uh, invasive pests or invasive plants, uh, as far as people mentioning outbreaks and when they're happening and where they're happening. Um, which is a fantastic study. But this one is called The Tale of Fight to Save New England's Native Rabbit by Elena Hancock of the University of Connecticut. And I found this on phys.org, which is P-H-Y-S dot org. Um, and I'll quickly try to get – it's a large, larger article, so I do recommend going and, and finding mm-hmm. it and reading it. Um, what is New England without the New England cottontail? This is a question that assistant professor of re- in residence Chadwick Rittenhouse, a researcher in the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment in UConn's College of Agriculture, Health and Natural Resources, asks. As a wildlife biologist, Rittenhouse understands the value and need for biodiversity, but as a New England resident, he says losing the native species would be akin to losing maple syrup from Vermont or, or Mount Washington in New Hampshire. Uh, the New England landscape would not be the same without its only native rabbit. New England cottontails face many challenges, explained Rittenhouse, from changes in landscape like development, fragmentation, or loss of habitat to the encroachment of another look-alike species, the eastern cottontail. Once distributed throughout the region, now where New England cottontails are found, they seem to be barely hanging on. A regulatory decision has brought the New England cottontail into a limbo-like situation, and now Rittenhouse is one of the researchers pulling every lever available in the cause to conserve the species as part of the New England Cottontail Conservation Initiative. Uh, cottontails are the fast food of the small mammal world, says Rittenhouse, making them an important component in the food web, which isn't always what we think about like with rabbits, that just how important they are as a food source for other, oh, yeah. other wildlife. Yep. Just about everything eats them from owls and raptors, red-shouldered hawks to terrestrial-based predators like foxes and coyotes and bobcats who are really, really good bunny eaters. Bunnies are uh, primary consumers, meaning they eat vegetation, preferably native plant species for New England cottontails, and convert plants into muscle protein. Predators eat the protein, and those nutrients then travel through the uh, trophic web. Researchers are still studying the New England cottontails' other roles with the ecosystem. And we talked about that with with Doctor Enrique Sala. Just that mm-hmm. you know, even if we don't get the nutrients directly from plants, other things eat the plants, and then we eat them. Yep. So you yep. need that transfer of energy. Um, let's see. 
Uh, New England cottontails tend to be found in younger forest and shrubland habitats, and Rittenhouse says that particularly in Connecticut, the forests tend to be more mature. Put simply, we don't have a lot of young forests, and troublingly, we don't have active forest management. Most of the efforts in New England cottontail conservation have recognized that we think they're a habitat-limited species, so let's go out and do some habitat management, and they should respond. This strategy seemed promising when the New England cottontail was considered – for endangered species status in 2015, but the path to protective status is not always straightforward. This, uh, for species that face uncertain futures, proactive conservation through the policy evaluation of conservation efforts is a preferred approach where measures can be taken before uh, the need to list them under Endangered Species Act. With PECE, the conversation, conversation conservation approach uh, is seen as a bottom-up and more collaborative between all stakeholders, whereas the top-down ESA, there are more regulations and penalties associated with listed species, and the protection process can become more punitive and less collaborative. PECE also stipulates that if conversation, uh, conservation efforts already underway are effective and likely to increase a species' chance of survival, this could preclude them from listing them under the ESA. In short, PECE gives credit for conservation actions – that have been enacted and those that are planned to be enacted. While PEC can uh, ensure resources are focused on the most at-risk species, Rittenhouse explains the PECE decisions can bring species status into an awkward place because there are currently no mechanisms in place that allow for reevaluation if the conservation measures do not work out as planned. This is what's happened for the New England cottontail. Uh, I'm going to skip through because we're there's still like three or four pages <laughs> of this. So um, – uh, these policy decisions pose challenges for other species as well. On the other side of the spectrum, populations of grizzly bears and wolves are in the lower 48 are doing very well because of policy decisions, almost too well, and there are challenges in delisting species. Grizzly bears were listed. Conservation actions work. The situation in the same for wolves in northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, and upper peninsula of Michigan are doing fantastically well. There are other species that haven't really benefited from a listing decision, but they can't get delisted. Now the New England cottontail is in this weird space where it didn't get the benefit of a listing decision, and it's worse off. It's a very interesting parallel. Those working to conserve the New England cottontail are pushing on several different fronts with some of the funding efforts directed towards zoo and breeding programs. I would also, I would say also advocate for forests, including young forests and shrublands for New England cottontail and many of the other species that rely on these habitats. Rittenhouse says, this really is a team effort and we're all working hard to try to move into the same direction, which is now the benefit of the New England cottontail. It's a multi-fronted approach because the rabbit needs a lot of attention quickly or we might not get another chance if we sit on this for another five to ten years. So it kind of made me think of quail in our area, mm -hmm. which just – you think of that defragmentation and the loss of habitat, and it always comes down to this shrub habitat. And how many forests do we walk through where there is no shrub habitat? Yeah. Yeah. And we just talked about this with – with the the screening using understory shrub habitat, so you can create habitat for uh, for animals like this. So it's just sad to see like a native species that is really important in the food web for so many other native species mm -hmm. dwindling down. We know it's dwindling down. We've known it's dwindling down. Yep. Yep. Being bogged up in policy, seeing the problems that face it get worse, and not really have a solution to help this. Um, it's a really interesting art, article. They do uh, go into the, the steps ahead and, and some more of the policy. Um, I would really recommend if you get a chance to read it. It's because for every tale there is of someone like the New England Cottontail, I'm sure you could go into <laughs> five per state and find a very similar. Oh, yeah. What, one of the things I didn't realize is that there – well, that there was a New England Cottontail. Versus the Eastern Cottontail. I didn't know that either. And then I pulled up pictures. I'm like, oh, I can see why they would be confused because they don't. They look too oh, – from a Google image search, they look identical. <laughs> they look exactly the same. All right. But um, there might be like a size difference or something like that um, in addition to other uh, DNA differences. But, yeah, it's um one of the things I, – I didn't want to ruin your – beautiful reading and just like gasp when it says oh there's not enough young forests and they aren't practicing forest management yeah i mean <laughs> I'm like, I, there's a lot of stewardship there's a lot the of time. stuff in this article where um there's environmental groups who would be very opposed to the actions that they're recommending for the this new England cottontail but you you mentioned earlier again succession and yeah. how important 
you know, we talk about yeah. how important of a thing is. So if mm-hmm. you have only old growth forest, you've negated succession. Yeah. The other thing, uh, and and you didn't read it. I was reading ahead in your article a little bit, but there's a whole section on while this wasn't listed, and it's kind of weird. It's a quote, and I'm like, I, I don't know with the context. Are they editorializing a little bit here or not? Which but, is possible. But they start bringing up like um, how putting or listing uh, on putting the grizzly bear and wolves on the endangered species list help their populations recover. But then they start talking about how, and I and I agree yeah. with what they're saying. Uh, just to be completely honest, and I know a lot of people don't agree with what they're saying, but the problems with delisting once those populations recover the goal is to take them off yeah <laughs> it's it's not to just leave them on forever and they're saying how there's issues when okay you get them on the list how do you get them off the list yeah. like there's there's metrics that need to be met and what we've seen in case of the grizzly bear and the wolves is you're meeting them not everywhere but in pockets and now because they're federally listed you're having issues in uh, like the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, you're having major wolf issues there. Yeah, but they're a federally listed species, so you can't. You it, can't it becomes handle. a double edged sword. <laughs> yeah, it becomes so, a double edged sword. You 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 yeah. you make you make all these arrangements to protect them, mm-hmm. and then you can't control them. Yeah, they're so yep. protected that they can get out of control. Yeah, and um, it made me think of the Terminator. You know, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> so no i think we have two great articles it's yeah. funny Fran, because a lot of our things have just tied into the next we're getting better at this i think we really are where our and it's one topic is like tying into the next thing and uh and this really ties in well to this or that oh you can get with this or you can get with that <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> All right. Listen, two great articles. You have to vote. Uh, we'll have it up on social media. So uh, make sure you go and vote because. Did I say this or that? Yes, you oh, did. I meant to say, I meant to say it, it really plays into um, – it's funny we do all these like behind the scenes cues and Fran did not. I said the wrong thing. You said this or that. Fran so I was did like, not oh, do the we thing already, I was expecting. We just did to do. this or that. What it really ties into well is. And of course, the choice is yours. All right, before we do listener shout outs, I thought it would be a good opportunity. We keep talking about a native plant every day with Tom and Fran coming back, mm-hmm. and I keep saying we're going to start recording, even though we haven't. Hopefully, next week we actually start recording, but. I thought it would be a good opportunity to introduce our new producer of that podcast, mm-hmm. Christiane Goodenough, uh, because you're going to hear her on that the beginning of each episode. So why don't you say hello? Hi there, everyone. I'm looking forward to stumping Tom and Fran as much as possible yeah. and showing I- Fran he really doesn't know everything. <laughs> The funny thing is I admit all the time that I don't know anything. That's fair. That's that's very fair. Yeah, now, now, Christiane, you've been hard at work putting these together. Have you been yeah. taking any, like, performance-enhancing supplements to to get you through it? That, I have she, to she may have to do that to get through the work day with me. <laughs> that's a given, but uh, when I heard Fran talking about the magic mind coming on, for me, I'm like, I, I like to try as much as I can, and I have a six-month-old daughter right now, and if sleep is something that people get easily, it's not something that I am getting easily. Did I did I mention <laughs> I'm a sleep champ with my new fitness watch? Like, my sleep score is, like, better than, like, the top percent. See, Are I you thought sure? you said it was the other way and that you were one of the worst, but I just no. kind of overheard it. No, I'm one yeah. of the best. Yeah. Like, I'm a sleep boss. <laughs> <laughs> But, but no, I, I sympathize with you, Christiane, cause, and my son's out of it now. But, uh, yeah, those first couple months, you don't get a lot of sleep, and you wake up groggy, and you don't, as someone who didn't drink coffee, I don't know what to do. Um, so, no, I like that's one of the things I found with Magic Mind, too, is I just, as soon as I drank it, as soon as I sniffed it, you just felt like a little bit more awake. But you didn't feel jittery. You didn't feel like... No, well, I when I would drink coffee on occasion, I feel really crappy, and I don't get that feeling with it. It's just I feel really super productive. I've you, entered that flow state. You don't get the anxiousness. How 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 has it worked for you? The, I just feel purposeful, and it 
it's interesting because that's a first. It, yeah. <laughs> As someone who struggles to find words, that's a word I would yeah. use to describe that. No, that's, no, uh, purposeful. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. But like on the weekends, especially, I find myself at home with the baby, and uh, sometimes it's just easy to sit on the couch with her as she takes a nap. But when I'm taking the magic mind in the morning, I'm saying, "Uh, like it'd be really nice to lay down." But I've got this list of things, and for the first time in many months, I'm feeling the drive to actually get them done as well at That's the same awesome. time. That's so. awesome. I'm finding, especially this past week, that I am more alert to to tease people in the office. Yeah. Are you seeing that? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, I'm on my game. I'm on my game all of a sudden. Fran is just sitting there waiting. And the <laughs> ears bounce. are always turned on <laughs> and paying attention. But to no, I feel, I feel much more alert and active in my everyday life doing that and it's the funny thing is you don't realize that you're missing it until you get it back Mm -hmm. and then you're like wow i I haven't felt like this in in a while and like even though i've started limiting myself to one cup of coffee we went to the trade show last week i had no coffee Mm -hmm. i had no issues like i I think i can finally pretty much say goodbye to coffee yeah Yeah. and i'm finding that there is zero chance we're ever going to be able to keep a native plan every day to under 15 minutes an episode. Uh, if, now, if, if, there's I, if there's us. three of us in the room, that's just not going to no, happen. We, Fran, we have a code. We do have a code. So uh, if you go to um, www.magicmind.co backslash native plants and you use the code native plants, N A T I V P L A N T S, you get up to 56% off your subscription for the next 10 days using this code. Uh, if you don't get the subscription, you can still get 20% off a one-time purchase, but it's a, uh, it's a guarantee. So if you can, you can quit at any time on the subscription. So if you try it and you don't like it, you, you can, you can quit. So it's not, not like it's locking you in. I, I highly recommend using the, the subscription code. I, I found that once I've done it, I, I was a little hesitant, but once I, I did it, there's no turning back for me. I can't see myself not using this product and I'm, I'm thrilled with the the work that they do globally and the ingredients that I'm putting in my body. So make sure you go visit and we'll we're we're coming up. We're only a little over a month away from a native plant every day with Tom and Fran. Do we have to alter it and say and Christiane? Uh, I don't no. think we I think no. it's going to knock us and down too. too many pegs if we alter the title. <laughs> yeah. Although no. hey, we might hit those like New and noteworthy charts oh. if we change the title. Oh, and I know with season two, it's already going to help. But it is. Uh, if if I ever saw us on the Apple new and noteworthy charts, I would I would don't know what I would do with myself. Me I'd be like, oh, my God, this is crazy. I'm still but, waiting. I'm still yeah. waiting. So, so, all right, let's uh, – enough of that. We should probably kick into listener shout-outs. Listener, listener, shout-out, shout-out, shout-out. Uh, yeah. I'm having and a friend, what I was – uh, trying to say for is really ties well into listener shout out. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not that it ties in well to your because oh. one of my listener shout outs is a guy I just met last night. Okay. Um, and uh, New Jersey is a very, there's a very hot button issue. I just in the wait, I just love space. how you say we're getting so good at this and then we just <laughs> then messed we just, it all up. We, we messed it all up. Yeah, no, I was I was really giving us a compliment. Man, our, we're getting really a lot. I, our segues still need some work. But we're really doing a good job of where we leave off of one topic is actually like the start of the next topic. Yeah. We've done it a bunch this episode. But I met a guy last night. Hot topic hot topic issue in New Jersey right now is what to do with black bears. Um, one of the things Governor Murphy ran on. And I'm not going to – I don't want to get into this no, very we're, much. No, we're just saying that's just this. one of his platforms. One of his yeah. platforms is I'm getting rid of the bear hunt. We're seeing surging black bear numbers. And there's – when you have that, there's more human and bear interactions. So they put in actually a, a managed black bear hunt, uh, an emergency black bear hunt to kind of bring this population number down. And now they're saying, well, what do we do from here? And you have the, the New Jersey Fish and Game Council. You have the like Fish and Wildlife Service. And they're just basically they opened up to the public. Say, what do you want us to do? And um, you have a lot of environmental organizations. And what i getting at, last night they had um, – like a hearing basically where people could show up and sp- supply public comment on what they thought was the best practice. So you have a lot of environmental organizations saying, or I shouldn't say animal or environmental organizations, but like animal rights organizations saying, Hey, no bear hunt by any means necessary. We can't do it. You have 
some environmental organizations that are coming out on both sides. You have hunting organizations that say, hey, we need to support population or scientific-based population control. And hunting is a major tool in the toolbox. Why would we take a tool out of the toolbox just because we want to or yeah. we feel like it? So I'm a member of our New Jersey Backcountry, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers which is a big advocacy group for public land and, and access to public land for hunters and fishermen. Um, and they urged a lot of people to go to that. And I didn't get a chance to go to that. You can also submit your testimony online till February oh, okay. 3rd. Too. Oh, okay. So we'll All put right. a link in the show notes for that. Um, if you feel like weighing in, you're from New Jersey, you feel like weighing in. Um, but so they're, New Jersey backcountry hunters and anglers advocate for a lot of people to go and say, hey, let's meet up this Tindall Road Brewery in Bordentown uh, that night. Uh, they do one of the things I appreciate you'll, is they have these plant nights. You'll get me to a, a yeah. meeting pretty quickly if you have it at a brewery. It's kind of what we did for the native plant growers. Yeah. Hey, you go meet at a bar, have a couple drinks. It's nothing really formal. It's just like bringing people who are passionate about the same thing to one place to kind of communicate and see what comes out of it. Yes. Um, and we got there, and I didn't really see. Usually, you can tell who's in that group because they just have a a, a look to them. They dress a certain way. <laughs> They dress similar to how I dress, yeah. I guess is how I want to how I want to put it. And I'm looking around, I'm like, I don't think anyone in here is in this group. And then a guy walked in later, and I was like, Oh yeah, he's definitely in that group. Okay. And I went and we were about to leave, so I was cashing out my tab, and I said, Oh, did you go to the the um, the black bear thing? And he said, Yeah. So he's like, It was just me, and there's one other person there. I got there around seven, and um, I was like, Yeah, it was. I wasn't sure if I want. I had some meetings that ran late, so I wasn't able to make it in person, and I was kind of torn because we were with a native plant nursery, um, yada, yada. And he's like, oh, what native plant nursery? I told him it was Pinelands. And he's like, oh, I listen to your podcast. Are you Tom? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. So my listener shout out, that was a long story to get to this. Wow, that's awesome. My listener awesome. shout out is, uh, is Levi Morris, um, just because I met him uh, at the time of recording last night, yeah. but it was, it was uh, what was that, Wednesday night. Yeah, awesome. Um, and, uh, Thank yeah, you, Levi. Listen to the, and he works for New Jersey Audubon. Oh, so in, uh, in South Jersey. So that was also a really cool connection there because we work cool. with them quite a bit. And then we also had a, a five-star review, and that was uh, Avert Lake House. And, um, and they said it was not too scientific, which is a huge compliment that for is. me because that was one of our mission statements going in is a lot of this plant, native plant podcast stuff can get ooh, Wait, too scientific over my me. head. Yeah. And, um, and we want to make sure this is approachable for everyone. Still give – a lot of good information, but have it in a digestible format that people can really take it in and, and learn from it, even if they don't know much about native yeah. plants. So, so I really appreciate that. Yeah. That was wonderful feedback. Mine is uh, one of the listeners that stopped by our booth, and it wasn't even to say hello. They were walking by our booth and caught the eye. Uh, Tom put in our booth a some of our book collection, and they caught the um, Cattail Moonshine. Mm-hmm. Uh, book and they were enamored by it and then it was Anne English who is actually the author of A is for Aquaphor which we talked about on this podcast I believe did you buy it for my dad bought it for dad? for Graham and I'm thinking at our future stuff I'm gonna have to take that one down yeah and um it was that was a nice we didn't get a ton of comments on it but, but it just like kind of tied the, to we had Greg Kepper's together. book and he just yeah. happened to stop on our booth and see and he was yeah he was like oh my god you have my book here <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but, we do because we use it all the time. And we had a lot of former guests stop by. Claudia West stop by. Yeah, Greg Kepper yeah. stop by. Um, I, I know I'm missing a uh, lot. Andrew Bunting from, Andrew Bunting from uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania Horticulture Society was by. Uh, uh, there's a whole bunch. Yeah. Steve Castrani, uh, Daryl Kabeski, uh, Carrie, um, Carrie Stanker. Stanker was there. From, uh, uh, Sunset John, Sunset John Mark Courtney. Jim, yeah. Jim McKenzie, McKenzie from, from Octorero. Some, some of our, our nursery compatriots were you know there, and i didn't so. think about huge shout out to the folks at for john courtney and and kind oh, yeah. earth growers uh because they actually said they play our podcast over the loudspeaker while yeah. they're working uh which we really appreciate but but ann stopped by and i and mentioned that she was a listener and uh she comments a lot on linkedin on or, or mm. likes a lot of our posts so we really appreciate you stopping by, uh, and we'll make sure we add that book to the the trade show. Yeah, uh, and I was upset that I wasn't there when she stopped by, so I could say my son is able to say he's two and a half. He's able to say aquifer, but he's still working on bath <laughs> bentho macroinvertebrate, which is <laughs> B is for <laughs> bentho, 
<laughs> we were getting through the book one by one, but um, but we appreciate everyone that stopped by. Thank you. And the list was almost too long to mention of the the amount of people that yep. stopped by. But thank you to everyone who took the time out to come see yeah. us. So we, I would we, say, you want to just move right along to our topic here? Yeah, let's let's yeah. move on to the topic. So I just wanted to follow up. I was so excited after speaking with Mary Phillips. Speaking of past guests, we got Mary mm-hmm. stop by yeah. uh, our booth. And we got to say uh, hello to Mary in person. And I was just so excited after that episode of the National Wildlife Federation. Um, I thought it would be good to follow up on some of the things. So uh, one of my takeaways was I didn't realize how many of our listeners were, had certified wildlife yeah. habitat. So I am now uh, a certified wildlife habitat. I'm waiting for my mm-hmm. sign to arrive. Now I'll, I'll very proudly disp- display that. But in our Facebook group, we learned Alyssa Joy Lewis, Tim Treacy. Tim Treacy did 10 acres? I think so, In yeah. Massachusetts, uh, Jennifer Cabrera and uh, Denise Alvarez all were already certified. And I'm, if there's more, I, maybe we should start a post. Mm-hmm. And everyone show us your certified wildlife habitat yeah. sign yep. and just see how many of our listeners have uh, certified wildlife habitats. But the other thing was Mary gave us a lot of uh, references and links mm-hmm. to – information on the national wildlife federation uh website and when i was posting it i was reading it all and it just was really really nice to see that in the research that is being done a lot of which was from dr groffman's peter groffman's yeah that's uh, what i was gonna say you i you had the conversation then you told me about it but i'm like oh man that's it's always strange to me how like we always talk about how these groups need to be working together, and then it's like, oh, you find out some of them are, and uh, and, and so yeah. And the show notes, he's part of the webinar. Yep. Uh, so yep. And we have the link for that in the show notes for that that episode, which is one forty. Mm-hmm. Um, if you if you want to watch that webinar, and I think uh, Mary was saying Dr. Emil Devito was supposed to be part of it, and something happened, and he couldn't. Mm-hmm. So a lot of great information, but looking at the research, it's showing that everything that everyone is doing is working. The yep. overall awareness is up. I think it was one in four people are planning on buying native plants or mm-hmm. are thinking about native plants when they're buying. Like the percentages may have went from nine to eighteen percent. Yeah, but they they've doubled, you know, and that's it's slowly working. Mm-hmm. Messages like we do on the podcast or other podcasts, it it's making a difference, and the awareness is up, which bodes well for all of us and and our natural resources. So it was just very nice to. Uh, to see research being done that's saying – like do we make a difference? Is this making a difference? It's making a difference, and ev- all the things that all of you are doing is making a difference, becoming a cert- uh, certified wildlife habitat, spreading the message. Um, you know, Denise Alvarez posted it in the group. Did you see – I think it was uh, Cranberry um, uh, Library has a seed exchange in the library, mm-hmm. and they have a, one of the Girl Scout Gold products. Uh, it had like plant this, not that. Oh, you know, nice. guide to native awesome. plants, you know, and it was all seed exchange. She took some seeds. You can take se- like, and that's in the public mm-hmm. library. It's becoming. I think we donated seeds there. Too. I, I believe we did. But too. I don't remember. We donated to a couple. We've had libraries reach out that have done that. And yeah. We said, yeah, we'll, we'll throw you something. So, um, and one of the sources we did have one phone call, um, and we thought we would tie it into this. Eve, who has, who has called us before wanted to mention the, uh, plant finder, uh, um, National Wildlife Federation plant finder. It is still in the beta. It says beta, I think, on yeah, the, yeah, the it's, website. It's, they've they've been working on it for a couple of years, but, but it's, it's definitely in, in their beta phase. And I I remember when they first started, I looked up and I'm like, oh, there's really not a lot on here. And just looking today versus when I looked a year ago, it's like there's ten times as much. Yeah. So I think it's it's just it's, it's a huge undertaking. Yeah, it's so. not comprehensive. So yep. don't be discouraged or don't think that that's like. It's not listing everything, and it mm-hmm. doesn't have all the resources and not showing you all the places you can find yeah. it. it. But it's 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 going to take. Yeah. But I, also, don't go on and say, "Oh, this, this is, is it. this yeah. is all I have," because it's like it's it's in the the process of of becoming a really. Yeah. It's already a useful resource. It's going to only get better. But for those who are aware of that, I could see why that would be daunting if you go on saying, oh, they only have one Viburnum listed. Mm-hmm. I think that was one of the examples yep, that yep. Eve listed. And it, it wasn't even something yeah. native in her county. It was native in the state. So it's 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 not gospel. It's mm-hmm. it's it's a work in progress. It gives so, you yeah. – well, when it's done, it'll give you a 
a launching pad where you can go on there and say, okay, here's things I can look at, and then you can decipher more based on your own um, standards. If yeah. you say, hey, I want to keep stuff that's native to the state or native to the region or native exclusively to my county, you, may you have can to start making those decisions. But it gives you a you can starting list app. to start going at. You can maybe take yeah. that, go to Bone Apps, and, and yep. find out a little bit, what's it, Biota of North America Project mm-hmm. yep. uh, to get more information for that. So. I, I just thought it was really good, and we agreed uh, after speaking with Mary that we're going to do a part two in the spring. So mm-hmm. we kind of felt like we covered all the bases but didn't really get a chance to go in depth on a lot of it, and we felt the same way when we were talking to Dr. Peter Groffman. Uh, so we're going to do a follow-up in the spring and do a part two and uh, and be able to talk about that. We're actually yeah. – I you know it's a little off topic, but we're excited about next week's episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we're bringing Sam Hoadley back on from yeah. Mount Cuba oh, yeah. to talk about uh, the specific trial that they just released the findings for, yep, which is the, the carriage trial. trial. So we're hoping that on a yearly basis we can have Sam come on and talk about what they what do most recently. Yeah, so we're excited to bring you that information next week, so make sure you tune in. But uh thought it would be a good idea to hit take it or leave it, and I was just thinking – I don't know what made me think about this the other day. I'm having trouble starting to come up with. But I was just doing a lot of hiking with mm-hmm. my wife. There's a lot of trails put in, yeah, which creates a lot of disturbance based on mm-hmm. the the course of the trail or, yeah. or even like the bridges. So what do you think about hiking? Tra- Are we doing too much with hiking trails? <laughs> I'm like, uh... granted, I know you can go and just get lost, you oh, know, yeah, but yeah, yeah. GPS is such a thing also. Like is, is hike- – are hiking trails – Good or, or do we actually create too much disturbance yeah. by walking With, um, those? Because if you notice a lot of these trails, it's all invasives along yeah. the, it, like the sides of the you're, trail. You're literally building a pathway for Invasive. things to be brought in. Yeah. Um, whether it's different bacteria, different plants, different seeds, yeah. other kinds of hit clear, the, animal you think hitchhikers. A, you think a clearing, yeah. you know. Um, That's a tough hard. one for yeah, me. It's a re- so this – to me, it all boils down to where you fall on this, like, environmental ethics spectrum because you have, like, I've mentioned it a long time ago, but you have your preservationist, conservationist, restorationist, yeah. uh, and all these different things in between. And, like, conservationists are probably where I'm the closest to, I guess, where it's like, hey, we need to conserve these spaces so that we can utilize them, but we can't ruin them. Yeah. We can't be extractive. Yeah. Um, but like make them so that we can have like low impact activities like hunting, fishing, yeah. hiking, that kind of stuff so that people can see them, see how important they are. And then there's more money going into preserving the, or conserving these places. If you take the preservationist route, it's like, we don't, no one can see these because just setting foot here ruins it. It's yeah. no longer wild as soon as a person steps foot here. I think that's probably a little extreme, but it's. My wife and I were on a uh, – the example I always use. My wife and I were on a vacation in Iceland, and there's a glacier. And it's like there was a sign that says no no one allowed past here um, unless you're going on like a hiking excursion on the glacier. We're like a quarter mile from the glacier, and no one stopped. Everyone kept walking. There's no one to the police it. And then you hit another sign that says like the exact same thing. It's like you need to turn around now if you are still going. And we, we walked right up. We didn't ignore the signs, too. But I'm like, the ethic there is no one's stopping, and that's an issue. People are always going to push that line. So where do you draw the line knowing that people are going to push it so that you aren't, you're aren't you still preserving a certain amount of it? Listen, like there's, I, I, there, We stopped in, at the edge of the glacier. People were walking up on the glacier, and then without the crampons and all this. And then there's the people actually going on the hikes that – Paid the money to yeah. do it and all that. But there's people who are just hiking there and they're just climbing up on it. Listen, and, I'm, I'm guilty, and I'm going to yeah. give you a, a specific example. Uh, when when we go up to New York, uh, mm-hmm. to the house in New York, we go to this Saratoga Spa yeah. uh, park to see the geyser. And everyone was kind of observing it from across the waterway. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I want to get closer. So we walked around the yeah. back. There was a trail around the back, and we walked right up to the geyser Yeah, and, yep. and took took photos. So when we went the next year – there were signs on the back trail saying you're not allowed past this point. You yep. know, yep. you know, because it is at risk for someone to get hurt as well. But, yeah. yep. but you're obviously, 
making it – enough people were doing it that it made an impact that they yeah. realized we can't do this. Yeah. And I realize if you didn't have a hiking trail for some of these areas, you're also maybe causing more damage that you're you're tromping through habitat. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. To Go, Going off trail is like a really big deal in a lot of these places. Yeah. Um, because it's just like you, it's minimal. But I, I we I was on a horseback riding trip through like the tundra in British Columbia at one point or Alberta, I think it was. And uh, this is when I was a kid. We always went on like horseback riding trips. Yeah. And it was like there was a big deal. It's like you do not go off the trail with your horse because it takes 10 years for that to grow back. Yeah. Just the one hoof print because it's such a minimal light, really short growing season. And it was like no trees. You're up yeah. above the tree line. And it was like it takes so long to grow back. And if you get enough people going off the trail, it's just not there anymore. You know, um, I, I did a horse back through the mountains of Montana. Yeah. But those horses knew oh, yeah. this is our path yeah. and we don't go off the path. Mm-hmm. But – you know, a, a large portion of that was pointing out wildflowers and meadows yeah. and so much of the wildlife that it was important to have that trail. Otherwise, you don't see it. Yeah. But is it just as much damage going on that trail? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, and, and if that's you where don't I'm, see it, it it's that, and that's where the line is. And uh, we're getting like you way to, more but you deeper to, than your question. You're supposed is. to be one with nature but, and be a part of it. Yeah. And not. And there's been all kinds of surveys it. on like with. In regards to, to hiking trails, and it's like the impact, What at what distance do humans affect other creatures? And it's like, I don't remember off the top, but it, for a, just a random number example, it's like, oh, once you're within like 100 yards of a deer, you're impacting their life. They're alert, and they're going to be getting out of there. So if you have a continuous train of hikers that are going down this trail – you can expect that you're not going to have deer within 100 yeah. yards of the trail. And, again, those are just made-up numbers for the sake of the example. But um, so you basically created a system where that you're not going to – and the mice have different yeah. barriers and bears have different barriers and birds have different barriers and where they feel threatened and alter their life cycle, which part of it was getting into, like, mating rituals. And it's like, oh, there's certain mating times, and they're not going to make those – like, a bird isn't going to make those mating calls – if there's people there because it feels threatened yeah. and within that that buffer. Um, so if you have a continual line of people there, those birds are either going to feel threatened and not make the mating calls, and now you have you lose a generation, or they're going to move to a different area. When, and, when we go on hikes now, I take my camera so that I can take mm-hmm. bird photos. Yeah. And there's a park in Burlington County that as you're going through the, the woods, you hear the birds, mm-hmm. but you never see them. It's amazing. Like once you – Try to take photos. You realize I hear them, but I I don't see yeah. them at all because yep. you're impacting. They're they're keeping that buffer that they mm-hmm. feel safe. Yeah. So yeah, it's a. Uh, I don't. I don't think I have an answer. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. To the, all right, the question. We, but it's like it's, and we talk about this on the secret tape. We basically talk not quite as in depth, but about a similar thing. And it's like you don't necessarily have to change your actions. You just have to be conscious of your actions. Um. And what I've found is when I start being conscious of my actions, I'm like, why am I really doing this? Yeah. Um, and so I'm not – I think it's important to get outside and – Explore nature. Ex- experience nature and, and f- like, recognize that you are the same thing. But we don't – and what I kept saying, we don't want to be extractive or consumptive from nature to a fault. You can be to a point, and then it's up to each individual person to find out what that point is. As humanity as a whole, I think we're way past that point. Yeah. And and I'm way past that point. But I'm thinking about ways I can say, hey, what what are some small changes I can make that will make a big impact or even a small impact on the back end? Um, like we were talking about picking uh, shed antlers in that yeah. other example. Yeah. And it's like, well, do I really need this? And it serves a great purpose in the – in it's the, a decoration yeah, for it's you. It's a decoration but it's, for me, but that's it's survival food for so for, many other things. So, else, like, yeah. I'm picking it up, and then we talked about like uh, Indian artifacts yes. and Native American artifacts. Yes. And it's like I'm picking this up, but it, it was it's here for a reason. Should I really be picking it up just so I have it in a collection? Um, that's another conversation for another. Well, day. you'll you'll hear it. <laughs> you'll hear it. At we'll some release point. it we'll at some it. point. Yeah. But, so, yeah. But, I, but I think that's a good. You know what? We kept it to an hour, and uh, it was a good conversation. Yeah, awesome. 
So, well, that's going to wrap us up. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed listening to The Buzz. Thank you, everyone, for listening to our Native Plants Healthy Planet presented by Pylons Nursery and Magic Mind. Thank you to RJ Comer for our Buzz theme music. Uh, make sure you stream or buy RJ's music on uh, wherever you consume your music or check out his Americana playlists on Pandora. You'll be happy that you did. Follow us on Twitter at Pineland Nursery, Facebook at Pinelands Nursery NJ, Instagram at Native Plants underscore Healthy Planet or at Pinelands Nursery. Also at YouTube at Pinelands Nursery. Don't forget about the question and comment line. Uh, you can call us at 215-346-6189. I will repeat that, 215-346-6189. Call us, ask a question, leave a comment, and we'll try to play it on a future episode of The Buzz. Uh, and uh, a bunch of new uh, – every 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 time we say this, a bunch of new uh, members of the Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group and a lot of fantastic conversations. So make sure you keep the conversation going over there. Yeah, so you can buy Native Plants Healthy Planet merch at nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. We have our, our Teespring store link right at the top. Uh, we don't keep any of the money that goes to the shirts. And we got a lot of compliments on those shirts. We, we wore them at uh, – I had enough of my own, even though my new ones didn't get here in time. I had enough of my own to wear them at, uh, at the Mid-Atlantic Nursery trade show and had a lot of compliments yes. on uh, – probably equally. I was wearing the, the first day, the, the – List the, of Dr. Talmy's like top trees, and then you had, had one that's a plant native, native plants. plants. Someone walked up and he was like, "Well, I know what you do." Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, and um, and then mine was a little more obscure, but people got it once they, yeah. they realized what it was. And I had that on the next day, and I think I wore the keep it native. Yeah, one. yep. The, the but one. um, yeah. So you can get those shirts, and you're gonna make a you're making a statement. You're giving back to organizations that can really use this money in a, a roundabout way. Um, so it's just a good cause, and uh, and it. It's like like I just said, people know what you're yeah. you're talking about when yeah, you have totally. a shirt that's plant native plants on it. So uh, you can also listen to Native Plants Healthy Planet uh, really at your podcast platform of choice, whether it's Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can hear us. Frankly, you're probably listening to us there right now. Yeah. And um, if you leave us a five star review, uh, one it goes a long way into into having to show up in front of more ears. Uh, more people will listen to us because it's just going to be presented to them through Apple and all these other platforms. And then two, it makes us feel really, really good. Yes. It feels like yeah. we're act- man, people actually like what we're doing. <laughs> this is great. And then three, if you do a little write up with that five star review, I will give you a shout out on Buzz episodes just like this one, like Everett Lake House. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, I I have a secret today. For all right, let's I hear was it. thinking about the other day. All right, uh, my dad went to Rutgers and we went to a Rutgers basketball game. And um, my son, as we're walking through the parking lot, first he was he was really fishing for a donut. He's like, "Oh, I smell something good. I smell a donut." And he did not smell a donut. I, he was just saying because he wanted a donut. I like that that uh, that line of action, <laughs> but, though. But later on, um, he, he's walking through and he says, "He's like sniffing really hard." And he's like, "I smell something. I I smell something. I uh, I smell a skunk." <laughs> and I was like. I'm glad you think that's a skunk because it, it was not. A, it was not a skunk. It was um, so, some uh, some people in the parking lot were partaking in, oh. in a, a legal practice he, here he, in New he, Jersey. Uh, he kind of smelled like a different kind of skunk. <laughs> yeah, and uh, but yeah, he identified it as a snu- and a skunk, and he was excited that he smelled a skunk. Um, I don't think many of us are, but I I was like, oh yeah, you you sure do smell a skunk. <laughs> oh, that's you're, awesome! You're two and a half. We don't need to go there yet. <laughs> we we, sell, we smelled some skunks in Baltimore. Yeah, also, we quite a bit. We did, but um, yeah. So with that, thank you, everyone. I'm Tom, and I am Fran. Thanks again, everyone. Tune in next week uh, for Sam Hoadley from uh, Mount Cuba about the Carrick's trials. We're happy to bring you with that. So uh, we'll see you again next time. And until then, keep it native. Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planted Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.